heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 345, covering the week of February 20th through February 24th, 2023. Glad to have you back on the program. Very glad to be here. Don't forget to Follow us on Twitter, like our Facebook and Gab pages, and subscribe to our YouTube page. The YouTube page really is great because we have all of our Abbeville U videos, these five to seven minute videos, and we are in the process of producing more of those. We also have our lectures, of course, this podcast. It is an invaluable resource, and it is free of charge. All of that stuff is there for you. All that educational material is there for you. So go ahead and subscribe to the YouTube channel. Also, if you're there and you want to support the Institute, click on that little heart under the videos, and that's the super thanks button. You can send a few pennies our way. Of course, we do exist on your generous contributions alone, so if you enjoy the Institute and you enjoy all the things that we do, the conferences, the webinars, the podcasts, the website, all of that stuff, you can give a tax-deductible donation to the full extent of the law at abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E. Just click on the little donate button while you're there. We don't have memberships. A lot of people ask, do you have a membership? Well, if you donate, that makes you a de facto member of the Institute. You're a supporter. So uh, we don't actually have membership plans, but we do have donors, and uh, that's what we do. So uh, if you give five bucks a month, you're a, you're a donor. You're, you're a member of the Institute, quote unquote. So uh, you can donate monthly, annually, or a one-time gift. We do accept uh all major credit cards. We do all those things. So you can go out to the Abbeville Institute website, abbevilleinstitute.org. That's A-B-B-E-V-I-L-L-E, institute.org, and submit a donation, and you become one of us. So while you're there, also give us that email address. We'll give you a free ebook, Exploring the Southern Tradition. It is a fantastic resource, free of charge. All you got to do is just give us an email address, and you get that ebook. Um, so it's written by 20 Abbeville, Abbeville Institute scholars, excuse me. And uh, it's a great, uh, great collection of essays, so you're going to want that. And, of course, you get on the email list, which gets you our daily emails, uh, any kind of advertisements that we have for conferences or other things. And speaking of that, we have our April event coming up, April 13th through 16th, 2023, at Callaway Gardens in beautiful Pine Mountain, Georgia. It is our 20th anniversary event, and time is running out to get on board with that. We only have a few weeks left that you can actually... Uh, Get a hotel room there, and it is a beautiful resort. You're going to want to stay at the resort, but um, you can uh, certainly go to the website, click on the events tab, and sign up for that event. It is a a must-attend event. You can't miss this. It's going to be so much fun. So go on out and click on the events tab and do that. We also have, if you're listening to this, um, the week of when it's produced, March 20th through 24th, we have a webinar coming up March 2nd. It's on 20th century Southern conservatism. It is free of charge. All you have to do is sign up for it. And if you're on the email list, you know about that. So that's why it's important to be on the email list because you do get uh, advertisements for those kind of things. So it's a free webinar on uh, 20th century Southern conservatism. You want to sign up for that. So all these great things that we do at the Institute are supported by you. And we appreciate all of it. Uh, I mean, look, we don't exist without you. Um, Also, you can get our logo and all kinds of cool stuff. You click on the Shop tab. You get uh, the Abbeville Institute logo. logo. It's high-quality embroidered materials. It's not just screen printed. It's good stuff. So you can do that as well. And and again, share our material around on social media. Rate this podcast wherever you get your podcast. Uh, Give it that five-star review. Leave a text review. If you're on YouTube, comment. Those things help get more eyeballs on the videos at YouTube. And anytime you rate the podcast and leave a text review, that also helps get people interested in the podcast because it moves it up the chart. So um, all those things are great ways to support the Institute painlessly. All right, well, let's talk about the material for this week. Uh, We had um, some really interesting material this week, and of course it was President's Day week, quote unquote, so we had a lot of focus on that. But I actually want to start with a Friday piece and then work backwards and talk about President's Day and uh, talk about the piece on Thursday too, because they all work together, whether you can see it or not. But Paul Yarborough writes about the Focons, and of course, Nikki Haley of South Carolina has decided she's going to throw her hat in the ring and run for president. Now, Nikki Haley is the embodiment of uh, the conservative that uh, just simply goes whichever the way the wind blows. 
Um, she's not really that impressive of a person. Uh, of course, there are all kinds of personal scandals and rumors about her as a person when she was in South Carolina, governor of South Carolina. A lot of people that listen to this show are not going to like Nikki Haley because of her actions in 2015 into 2016 with the Confederate flag in South Carolina. Um, but Nikki Haley in 2010 was speaking a much different tune because she wanted to be governor and she thought that uh, she needed to appeal to uh, people that, you know, in South Carolina who admired Confederate soldiers, who admired South Carolina's history and on the right. And so she was certainly appealing to those people. But just a few years later, she would say things the opposite of that. And of course, that ultimately resulted in the flag coming down from the state house grounds, not even over the dome anymore. I mean, this uh, that, 20 years earlier, nearly 20 years earlier, the uh, conservatives in South Carolina had capitulated and taken the flag off the top of the dome and moved it to a compromised position at the Confederate Soldiers Memorial on the grounds. And so at that point, uh, it was seen as, okay, we're here, we're, we're just going to leave it here. It's it's a battle flag. It's an honor of a soldier, uh, Confederate soldier. Well, that came down completely. And of course, as anybody knows that follows this stuff, that's not the real aim of these things. You know, the flag is harmless. A statue is harmless. All these things are harmless. While there's other real issues going on, this is all deflection. And so in areas like New Orleans or other cities where you have major problems of infrastructure and crime and other things, education, uh, we just saw a, a story, or if you haven't seen it, in Baltimore. Uh, there are no students in Baltimore City that are proficient in math. Um, there are some real structural issues out there, but all these things are taking precedent, right? We have all these idiotic culture war social issues that should be just left alone, but they're they're symbols uh, because it, it takes the pressure off of anybody to do anything about these other things, right? Who cares if your streets are crumbling, if your, if your sewers back up, because we have Robert E. Lee on a statue, and Robert E. Lee is causing all these problems. Well, I mean, it's just dopey. It's completely stupid. But this is, what, this is where these people live. They're all stupid. So, I mean, what do you get? Um, but that's the, that's the problem with this. And then you have conservatives whose simple response to these things should be no shut up. Um, and that's, I mean, I've said that on my own podcast. No shut up should be the response. The adults are, are here and, and the petulant children are just going to be quiet. Um, the two-year-old's throwing a fit over nothing. Uh, if you want more monuments, put more monuments up. Those monuments don't hurt you at all. And of course, when you look at Richmond, and we had a, a wonderful webinar on this and the artistic value of these monuments, if nothing else, uh, that, that Monument Avenue in Richmond was one of the true artistic thoroughfares in the world. And now that's all gone because you had, again, a bunch of outsiders principally in Virginia. Uh, and we had, you know, uh, Tim Kaine, who's an outsider, who's trying to take Lee's name off Arlington House. But of course, his wife is, uh, is um, someone who is interested in perpetuating this fallacy that somehow the declaration enshrined slavery and the constitution enshrined slavery. These things didn't do anything of the sort. But regardless, um, you have these dopes out there that are trying to do all this stuff. And, you know, Ralph Northam and all these people. So uh, that, that's a real issue. Um, and Tim Kaine is an outsider. And you have all these outsiders that moved in Richmond that get upset about a statue that has been there that people of Richmond have enjoyed. Now, I know demographics change and things change. And so there certainly can be a conversation about that in adding to Monument Avenue or adding to uh, the beautification of Richmond by putting up more, more memorials or more monuments, whatever the case may be, but you don't take the other ones down, particularly not ones that are recognized on the National Register of Historic, of historic Places. And, uh, you know, Arlington, uh, the Arlington Confederate Monument, same thing. The conservatives, quote unquote, in Congress facilitated this uh, naming commission because they voted for it. In fact, Trump tried to, override, tried to veto it and they overrode his veto. That's the most embarrassing part of this. You have conservatives sitting on those committees and, uh, you know, people like Mike Rogers in Alabama who wants to throw a fit in Congress and try to punch somebody out who's opposing uh, a, a faux conservative uh, and, and uh, Speaker McCarthy for the, for the speakership uh, because they wanted some concessions. You had conservatives saying, no, we want some concessions. We want some things to be done to ensure that perhaps uh, conservatives have a voice in this particular Congress, and we're not just going to go along with the Democrats all the time. We're not just going to go with the left. So conservatives are trying to stand up and do things, and you have Mike Rogers going to try to punch out you know, uh, Matt Gates for taking a stand. And Mike Rogers is a problem. He is one of the fools 
that was uh, so in insistent that this stupid uh, military spending bill goes through because it's for the soldiers. And so if the Democrats, of course, detach this ridiculous naming commission as part of that bill. It should have been vetoed, and then that, that should have been removed, and then they could have passed the bill again. So I, the fact is, uh, conservatives are their own worst enemies, and this is why Paul Yarborough's piece is so important. I mean, we have these fake people in the South who don't really stand up for the South anymore. There are no Southern conservatives. There are certainly mainstream conservatives, and there are Republicans, but there are no Southern conservatives. And I would say, you know, perhaps um, you could even make an argument that the left in the South is pretty much left out too. Um, now, old Southern leftists are definitely left out. And I know a lot of those people, and they're not happy with how the Democrat Party has moved so far left on things. But um, these old Southern leftists, you know, what you would call yellow Democrats or, you know, the, these, uh, these, uh, these kind of Democrats, these blue-collar Democrats, they don't have anywhere to go. Uh, and I see this all the time. They're voting for Republicans, not because they like Republicans, but because the Democrat Party has moved so far left. So these are real Southern liberals who like things like the New Deal, and uh, they like uh, some, of these, some of these programs that came out in the 1930s and 40s. And they, they don't mind the Great Society. They don't mind stuff like that. But they don't really like the direction of the, uh, of the a Democrat party, so they vote with the Republicans and hold their nose and do it, and of course the Republicans betray the South all the time. Uh, these are people that love the South, and, and Republicans have never been in favor of the South. So um, it's it's amazing how we have in the South we're no real Southern party anymore. It's uh, it's all gone, um, and that's something that you know we're going to get into next week with this webinar with Jay Langdale, who's written a really good book on. Uh, Southern conservatism in the 20th century. And he's going to talk about people like Richard Weaver and Mel Bradford and some of the great, the big names in 20th century Southern conservatism. The, of course, the fugitive agrarians, these kind of people who were so important for a long time, but really have been forgotten and pushed aside uh, by people like Nikki Haley. And I begin this because, of course, modern conservatives in the South are certainly in love with Abraham Lincoln. And um, you see it all the time. They'll uh, they'll say things very positively about Abraham Lincoln or positive you know positive things about uh, the the Union Army and the glorious Union Army during this time. And I'm reminded of um, you know some some of the things that have been said you know during the Bush years, for example. Um, and you had uh, uh, conservatives who would call Confederates the enemy quote-unquote conservatives who would call Confederates the enemy. These were the enemy. If you go to the National Infantry Museum in Columbus, Georgia, this is in Columbus, Georgia, and once in Fort Benning, they haven't changed the name yet. Of course, it's going to be Fort Hal Moore if these leftists get their way and it's not blocked somewhere. But Fort Benning, um, you have a scene, they call it the last hundred yards, and as you go through this spot, there's a, there's a depiction of every major American war. And, of course, you the second exhibit is the quote-unquote civil war, and you have the enemy as the Confederates. Um, they're the enemy. Um, and so that kind of mentality saturates modern conservatives, and this is why you have this Lincoln love. So we had a really great piece on Monday by Jack Marcourt talking about Lincoln's connection with Marx. Now, uh, that connection was simply correspondence. I'm not necessarily certain that Lincoln uh, really admired Marx that much, uh, but Marx was a war correspondent, and the two did correspond a little bit. Um, and uh, there were communists, though, in the Republican ranks. There were communists in uh, who had been Germans who had settled in the United States. These were called the 48ers. You certainly had these people. And so uh, you have this, uh, this real problem uh, with these red Republicans. That's what they were called. And there's a very interesting letter uh, from... Judah P. Benjamin, uh, who wrote to James Byard of Delaware. This was uh, early on in the, in the days before the war. And Benjamin wrote to Byard. They were good friends. Byard was a U.S. senator from Delaware. And he said, look, maybe one day we'll, I'll, we'll be free of my nightmare of black and yours of red Republicans. So um, certainly there's that racial element there, which people often focus on. But it's interesting that he brought up uh, the fact that uh, there were red Republicans. That's what he called them, red Republicans. And uh, these were the communists that were already in the Republican Party. 
and that were promoting this kind of revolutionary Marxism that would become certainly part of the push for the Republican Party moving forward. And so we often you know, think that Lincoln was this anti-communist and all these things, but he was allowing all of these leftists to infiltrate and have influence in this administration. Uh, the radical Republicans were certainly uh, you know, much more to the left. And so when Republicans run around and they champion uh, Reconstruction, they champion Thad Stevens, and they champion Charles Sumner, and they champion even Abraham Lincoln, what you're essentially admitting is that there is no conservative element to the Republican Party. Because the Republican Party has always been to the left. It's what R.L. Dabney pointed out after the war, that American conservatives don't really conserve anything. They just simply uh, uh, attach themselves to discarded leftist ideas. And he wrote this because American conservatism had moved to the left. And if you read Russell Kirk, for example, uh, his conservative mind, he talks about this period as conservatism frustrated. It's, it's, a, it's a different period of time. Conservatism frustrated. Um, it's... He's admitting, he's recognizing the real problems of American conservatism in the late 19th century. It was much softer than what you had seen before that, and it lost any of its Southern punch. You see, when the South was exiled from the Union and these conservatives went with it, uh, they really lost some of their intellectual firepower, and they never have really gained it back. The, the, the Republicans were always much more of a reformist slash progressive party, I mean, you saw it ultimately with people like Teddy Roosevelt and then moving forward with Taft and others. You certainly had some Republicans who you could say, well, I mean, these people were kind of conservatives. You know, people like Warren Harding and uh, William McKinley even made a Southern tour in the 1890s. But certainly they were uh, further to the left than what conservatives have been before the war. And uh, so you have uh, the South, again, being left out of all this stuff. When, when conservatism lost its Southern roots, American conservatism, it really was over for conservatism in America. And that, and that war in the 1860s did much to destroy it, North and South. Uh, northern conservatives, and there were a lot of real northern conservatives, lost their allies, and they no longer had control even under their own uh, political apparatus. So the progressives in all of these places really took control. And it was hard for uh, real conservatives to have a voice and influence you could say that maybe there was a comeback. You know, look, when, when Teddy Roosevelt ran for president in 1904, his opponent was Alton Parker. And Alton Parker probably was the last uh, real conservative to run for office. Um, and before that, of course, you know, Grover Cleveland had two terms. And uh, Southerners like Cleveland. He was the first Democrat elected when he was elected uh, in 1880 since uh, James Buchanan. He, of course, was a New Yorker. Uh, he had been against the war, didn't serve uh, in the war, uh, actually paid for a substitute. And so uh, Cleveland was considered to be you know, in line with this old Jefferson Jacksonian, you know, sound money uh, conservative party that had been there before the war. But again, once C Cleveland's out of office, you know, when he, when he gets his second term and he's out in 1897, uh, there really isn't anybody else that comes behind as term, in terms of a president that's going to be a Southern conservative. And you do still have some of them in Congress without question. And in fact, you would have Northerners complain about how much influence Southerners would have in Congress over the, the history of, of the United States. But uh, certainly Southern conservatives did not have as much of a voice as they did uh, at any time before the war. And um, that is, and, and again, by the, night, by the 20th century, uh, Southern conservatives are virtually gone. Uh, this is why you had these fugitive agrarians write, I'll take my stand. And Richard Weaver actually had a really good essay on that book. And he said, look, this, the amazing thing about that book is that for the first time, the South went on the offensive. They weren't engaging in what was called whataboutism. Well, I mean, what about you and what about you? That uh, you all did these things in the North that you're blaming us for in the South. It wasn't whataboutism. Um, it wasn't uh, defense of the Confederacy. It wasn't uh, you know some type of you know lost cause. Well, these this is the lost cause, and these people were great in defending your ancestors. It wasn't any of that. It was an assault on what the North really was, which was a soulless industrial ca industrial capitalist society that sapped real tradition from America. It was rootless, soulless, um, and. And the fugitive agrarians were, were giving it to the North. And this is why this book has pretty much been swept under the rug. 
Um, it's, it's not something that you're going to be assigned oftentimes, even though leftists, I've talked to leftists who really love this book too, because it is an agrarian manifesto. It is an attack on northern or Yankee industrial capitalism. Now, you could say that that has produced a lot of great benefits for America, uh, technology and uh, comfort, standard of living, all of these things. But the, the point of these fugitive agrarians was, okay, well, granted, you, and now, of course, they're writing this in 1930, so they're not seeing what we see today. But even there, you could say, well, I mean, there might be an increase supposedly in standard of living, but at what cost? What is the cost to the family? What is the cost to society? What is the cost of these things? And should there be a balance of that? And so their argument was actually regional government at one point. Their, their second book, Who Owns America, was even better. But their argument essentially was regional government. Let's have a situation where you can have some type of regional referees. Keep the union together. They weren't secessionists. Keep the union together, but have regional referees and let regions manage their own economies. Let regions have some control over their own lives and not be subjected to uh, foreign power, which would be, of course, in the South, New England. So, um, or New England in the South. I mean, that, that was the whole idea. Let's have some type of regional referees that can handle some of these things. So uh, I find this, uh, this uh, essay by uh, Jack Marquardt in Attaching Lincoln to the Marxist to be great. It was published on President's Day. And, of course, on Wednesday, we ran a really good piece about George Washington. You see, the original day was George Washington's birthday. And in some states... They still celebrate it that way. There's no official President's Day holiday. It's just recognized as President's Day. Officially, it's still George Washington's birthday. And there's a reason why we have that. I mean, look, the Federalists, beginning in the 1770s, celebrated George Washington's birthday. And uh, that, be, that carried through until the 1790s when Washington died. But even after that, you had celebrations of George Washington's birthday. Now, some people didn't like this because they thought it smacked of monarchy. Not the Federalists. The Republicans, the Jeffersonians didn't like it. They preferred to celebrate July 4th. And so uh, would, would Washington have supported President's Day is a question that you know some lefties ask. There's this really stupid uh, essay by a woman named Alexis Cole, uh, Coe, I'm sorry, Alexis Coe, uh, who um, wrote an essay in the New York Times about this. I think Washington certainly would have supported the celebration of his own birthday uh, nationally as well. I mean, over across the United States. Would he have supported a president's day? I'm not certain, but we know that the Republicans would not have done this. We know the Jeffersonians did not support a president's day. They thought it smacked of monarchy. And when Jefferson comes into office in 1801, the presidency certainly is downgraded. And it will have that, that position, even with someone like Andrew Jackson, for the next 60 years, with a couple of exceptions. I think you could say Jackson is one. Um, but, you know, even James K. Polk, who was much more aggressive and kind of elevated the position of presidency and, and how he was aggressive in foreign policy, even Polk retired after one term because that's what a president should do. That's a very Jeffersonian thing to do. Uh, Lincoln changed it all, you know, but uh, the, the one hiccup in all that is Jackson, who spoke a lot like a Jeffersonian, but then acted like a king. And this is why you have the Whig Party to begin with why South Carolina was voting against him even before the Whig Party was established anywhere else. But they were calling themselves Whigs in South Carolina. And, the, and King Andrew, they were against King Andrew Jackson. So you, you have all these interesting things going on. But this piece on, on Washington uh, is it's by Tim Duskin. It's, it's really good. Um, it focuses on the importance of George Washington and not some kind of amorphous President's Day where we celebrate you know, Abe Lincoln. Right? We shouldn't celebrate Abe Lincoln or we celebrate... Uh, you know, uh, Woodrow Wilson, or we celebrate Franklin Roosevelt, or some people that maybe abuse power, or maybe you're, maybe you like Roosevelt, but we celebrate, you know, George W. Bush. I mean, who knows? So we celebrate all these presidents, and do they all deserve it? I mean, are they all worthy of praise? Should we, should we celebrate the office of presidency? Should that be the main goal? Should we, should we worship the presidency, the American elected king? And I think that's a, the founding generation would certainly say no, and that, of course, is the problem. But again, all this ties back into the piece on Thursday on the destruction of Washington Street Methodist in, uh, in South Carolina in the last days of the war. When you celebrate Lincoln, that's what you're celebrating. You're celebrating the destruction of a church, the burning of a church to the ground. 
You're celebrating the destruction of a people and a place and, uh, you know, Sherman's men marauding through the South. You're celebrating that and celebrating Lincoln. We know that Lincoln chose Grant because he fought the war the way Lincoln wanted him to fight the war, and that was very aggressively. Uh, Lincoln was not someone who wanted reservation. He didn't like the generals that would be uh, that would have kid gloves with the South. He wanted the South punished. Even though he said something else, his actions spoke louder than words. Lincoln wanted the South punished, and he wanted the South unable to continue the war, and Grant fought it that way. Uh, you can also say, of course, Sherman followed the same pattern. Uh, Sheridan followed the same pattern. These people would be abusive after the war is over in the Western territories with the American Indian tribes, so there's, it goes beyond that. But uh, these men fought the war the way Lincoln wanted to fight the war, and I think that's something that's often missed. Uh, Lincoln was not conciliatory with the South during the war. He punished them. And even if he says in his second inaugural that, you know, with malice toward none, with charity for all, let's strive to bind up the nation's wounds, uh, that's not the way Lincoln operated when it came to selecting generals and pursuing a policy of destruction in the South. And again, I think this is the problem of someone like Nikki Haley, or some of the other Republicans in the South who just so freely attach themselves to the party of Lincoln without really questioning what that means. You're essentially saying that you believe in, in a second American revolution, that you believe the left is always right, uh, that you believe at the core, at its core, the le America is a leftist, equity-driven place because the proposition nation myth was created by Abraham Lincoln in 1860, uh, 1863. And uh, it's, uh, it's unfortunate that this is what the American right decides to attach itself to. Um, the destruction of a people and the destruction of a place. Uh, and of course, if, you're, if you can't leave, you're not free. And that whole discussion, which of course Marjorie Taylor Greene this week um, made a lot of headlines because she said we need a national divorce. Um, and people went ballistic over this. You know, People on the right went ballistic over it. Fox News was upset about it. You had Republican governors speaking out against Marjorie Taylor Greene. And we need, uh, we need the, so just simply bringing up uh, maybe that we have, you know, in, irreconcilable differences in people in the United States, maybe a political ir ir irreconcilable differences. And maybe we need to have a conversation about how we can decentralize or some things we could do to take power out of Washington, D.C. Simply the, the suggestion of that is met with such vitriol because, of course, Lincoln. I mean, the immediate response is, we, we had a war already. Well, why do we have a war? Well, because of Lincoln. I mean, it's, there's, there's nothing to say other than that. Uh, Lincoln chose war. Lincoln chose a policy that was not going to be uh, uh, conciliation. It was going to be aggression. He said it in his first inaugural address. That's what he was going to go do, and that's what he did. So um, and the Washington Street Church there in Columbia, South Carolina, which was burned to the ground, is a nice example of that. I mean, that's, that's Lincoln's conciliation right there. That's Lincoln's with malice toward none. But we often forget that uh, because uh, the common response is, well, the South deserved it. They were traitors. And you get this from Republicans, too. And, of course, that's the most embarrassing thing. So, uh, great pieces this week. And, of course, the last piece, Barbara Martha on Southern Quakers and how uh, how there's a lot of you know gray areas in the South when it comes to who Southerners were and these different cultures that, of course, had influence in the South. Um, and uh, there were Quakers in the South. And uh, Barbara Marthal uh, is, is African-American, and she's very interested in, in uh, the, this reconciliationist uh, message for the South. You know, how can Southerners uh, live together? And, and, uh, and she thinks that a lot of the things, of course, the left does are dangerous and for uh, peaceful coexistence for people in the South because it just riles people up and gets them very upset. And so she, she does genealogy and she says, look, we have a lot more in common than you realize. There's a lot of people, if you go back and you start looking at genealogy, you're going to find a lot of, a lot of people that uh, are actually cousins and related and, and uh, we have all of these similar things and there's a lot of real diversity in the South and, and uh, those things were often understood for a long period of time, but kind of swept under, swept under the rug for a while and uh, maybe we need to have this conversation again. So you have, uh, I love when she writes this kind of stuff and, and it's um, a very good uh, reconciliationist message in, in, uh, in America. And that's why we, we, we uh, publish these things. So uh, we had a lot of good stuff this week and a uh, great week at the Institute. And until next time, good day. <music>